This is, this is part three of a three-part training series. Um, one of those uh, training series is, was, uh, part one was held last spring. Um, part two was held hopefully this past fall for your uh, synod. And then um, at part three of the, uh, at the, at the start of the, at the start, uh, we shared with attendees the findings of the national study on youth and religion at the, and the exemplary youth ministry study. So a lot of what we're doing is based on those two studies, um, the national study of youth and religion and the exemplary youth ministry study. Um, one of the primary findings from this study is that youth believe in God. Yay! So this is good news, right? Or it seems like good news, um, but what we found also through the study is that, um, and what we learned is that what they believe about God is a little bit of a watered down version of Christianity. And the study calls this moralistic therapeutic deism. Um, and this creed that the youth and adults believe uh, is primarily about being happy and doing good. And I want to stress not just youth, what youth believe, but what we believe adults believe too, because the youth are learning from us. Um, this system is a system that's all about us and our needs. It depends largely on us, what we do and how we feel. Um, it's a cultural faith that has hints of Christianity. It might sound good on the surface, but it does not take into consideration a broken world in need of a savior, and it does not reflect a God who is intensely personal and will stop at nothing to come to us wherever we are. So what we're after in these training sessions is to deconstruct moralistic therapeutic deism, or MTD, in the lives of youth. What we want to do is make sure that the events that we offer, whether it's a one-time fundraiser or a week-long mission trip, don't lend themselves to MTD, don't support this kind of cultural faith, but instead that they strip away the cultural understanding of faith and challenge youth to experience Jesus Christ through authentic relationships and experiences that are rooted in sound theology and practices. So this is the, go this is the goal of our events. This is the purpose. Um, in the first session of the training, we talked about the purpose of events themselves, how to decide what type of events to offer based on the needs of your context, what your youth are looking for, what they need, um, what you feel you can give to them. Um, and then we also talked about what type of adults are needed to walk alongside young people and how we can be growing ourselves. During the second training session, we talked about preparing your group for an event. How do you make sure your, your event gets where you want to go? What were your goals, and how do you make sure that those goals are met? Um, how do you evaluate an event to make sure that you got there uh, and that you reached your goal? And then what are the preparation and logistics needed as you get ready, as you prepare, so that those goals can be met? Whether, again, it's for that one-time fundraiser or a weekend retreat. An event is not just going somewhere. An event is an experience that we, uh, that we prepare for and that we give. It's, it's, it's a, something that happens in a particular time and place. And so that might be a, a Wednesday night Bible study. It might be a one-time fundraiser. It might be your week-long mission trip. All these things, all these pieces are events um, that we prepare for to, uh, to encounter with our youth and experience with our youth. If you missed the trainings, the, the spring and the fall training, you can uh, go online to watch those. Those are available for you online. Today we might refer to a little bit of what was taught, but there's no prerequisite of having been to those two trainings to be able to do um, what we're doing today. What we'll be talking about today is how we help our groups experience the work of the Holy Spirit in the midst of an event. So during the event, and then how can we help them connect that to their daily life? So this is practical theology. This isn't just something that we put in our heads and walk away from knowing, but this is something that we want them to enact in their lives. This is something where we learn and we grow, and then we are changed, and we show that change in how we live. Events are opportunities for young people to disengage from the world around them so they can fix their eyes on Jesus Christ. Events take youth and adults out of their comfort zone so we can see the world and ourselves from Christ's viewpoint rather than our own. For transformation to take place, we have to be intentional about making time during an event to reflect on what we're experiencing, learning, and feeling. It's so important for us to recognize what's going on and to pull that out instead of just absorbing and not really ever talking about that. Otherwise, the event becomes kind of a blip on our radar screen, a blip on the, um, the faith journey that, um, that we're on, and, and we may or may not remember certain pieces. 
Uh, but when we take the time to point those things out, um, we tend to retain those and to remember those better. Um, worse, we inadvertently teach that faith happens only at the mountaintop event. We don't want just mountaintop events where we come away wondering what, what, what's the next event. We don't want faith happening only at church, only in the church bus. Um, we want faith to happen in our daily lives. So to be intentional about pointing out those, uh, those times when we see faith in action in our lives. Um, in the fall 2011 training, we talked about the purposes of event ministry and discussed how to make an event a transforming experience for the participants. And there are a few key factors in determining this audience, goals, and evaluation. And that's where all that preparation came in to play. How do you prepare? What are you preparing for? What do you want to see happen? And then figuring out, did that happen? Today, we're going to focus on ways that you can make those goals that you set for an event happen during the event. So how can we make those goals happen during the event? And we're also going to talk about how to connect what was learned at an event with their daily lives and how to share, maybe even share, go back and share what was experienced at that event with those who were not able to participate. Um, so again, we're going to focus on during the event today. Before we do that, I want to talk a little bit. Um, one of my very favorite books that I use in my class is a book by Kenda Creasy Dean and Ron Foster called The God-Bearing Life. And in The God-Bearing Life, um, they share a chapter entitled Hand-Holding and Finger-Pointing. Um, and they talk about this story of a mom walking through a park. Um, she's watching a mom walk through a park with a small child, and they're holding hands, and they're kind of teetottering around the path, not going in one particular direction, but kind of wandering. And the mother's holding the child's hand, and she's occasionally pointing out to things, and they stop and look. <clears throat> and this becomes a metaphor for spiritual direction for them. They write, spiritual direction is often considered one of the practices of communion, since the ultimate objective is not to offer moral instruction or pastoral care. The goal of spiritual direction is reaching oneness, reaching toward oneness with God by discerning God's direction for our daily lives. So hand-holding then becomes ministry of presence, and finger-pointing is ministry of direction. And if we use this metaphor as we think about how to process events with youth, our goal should not be to tell them how to be transformed. This is how you should be transformed. This is how you should be changed now, and this is what you're going to go back and do. But we open a conversation in the midst of that, um, and perhaps we point out a few things for them to, to notice or to observe or to hear, and we participate with them. Our presence is key. So hand-holding. One of the skills that we need for hand-holding is to participate with young people. And let's look at what this means. Participation during an event is active. That means we can't sit in the chairs around the back of the room and watch. We have to get up and participate. Um, ex we have to experience the event fully. So if there are games that are happening during your event, get up and play the games with the youth. Uh, be willing to sing. Sometimes when we let our guard down a little bit, uh, you know, it's a, one of those events where it's a little nerve-wracking and everybody's, all the kids are kind of standing around looking at each other, wondering who's going to make the first move. And then it's us. And we kind of let our guard down and allow them to get a little bit silly too. Um, so experience the event. Um, participate in discussion. It's really important for us to share our own experiences and our own transformation in our lives, our own faith stories with young people. Um, but again, we don't want to dominate. So a good rule of thumb when we're participating in discussion with our young people is to allow um, two to three youth to share before you do. Or maybe throw a little teaser out there, but somehow get them talking and then share part of who we are too. And just uh, participate, but don't dominate. And then also as we participate, as we experience the event fully, we, we want to be open to learning with them. Because we can always learn and grow too. And that's um, as we learned in the first section about, or the first session about what kind of adults we want walking with youth. These are the kind of adults that we want wor walking with youth. We want adults who are going to be willing to grow and learn right alongside the young people. We want to observe what's going on with the youth, who is talking, who is not. We want to read their body language. Um, pay attention. So we're participating. This is where it gets tough. We're participating, but we're also observing. We're also watching what's going on. Who in our group is involved? Who is not? 
What, what's the body language if they are involved? What's it really saying versus what they're saying? Um, who are the leaders and who is following? What's going on with our uh, young people? What are their aha moments when you see that light bulb go on and, the, and you know that something just clicked? What is that? And talk about that with them. Um, if it's appropriate in the midst of, of the discussion, if not, pull them aside and go, I, I noticed this. I saw this happen for you. What was going on? And let them share that with you, but pull those moments out and talk about them if possible. <clears throat> and try to draw out and include youth who may seem distracted or left out. Find ways to, uh, to partner with them. Find ways to be in conversation with them. And then finally, translate your experience into a story to share. Because you're participating fully, because you're experiencing, you, have, you will have a story as well. So pay attention to what your experience is. You're paying attention to them. Also pay attention to what you're experiencing. Where did you feel weird? Where did you have your aha moments? Um, where did you feel disconnected? How is that impacting your own faith life? What is that drawing out of you? And then how can you share appropriately your own experience with youth as you later process together? So think about ways that you can share, but share appropriately. We want to be healthy with our young people. We want to be um, mentors for them. Um, and it's okay to grow and learn together, but um, we don't want to, uh, as I talk to my class, we don't want to need them more than they need us in some ways because it's really important for us to have those healthy boundaries as well. So, but translate into a story to share because they definitely need to hear our stories and that's part of why we're um, experiencing with them and participating with them. Participation is genuine. Participation is genuine. So expect to be transformed yourself. If you are experiencing and participating fully with young people, expect that transformation and growth will happen for you too. And that's exciting. That's the fun part of doing this. I, um, a few years back when the ELCA gathering changed uh, the ratio of adults to youth to allow more adults, it's, it's been shocking and surprising for me and, and in some ways wonderful and in some ways a struggle to see the number of adults who are wanting to sign up to go to the ELCA gathering, youth gathering. Um, it's wonderful, but I have to say I wonder why and is that because we also desire to be fed and nourished and what an opportunity for us when we participate with young people to, have, to be able to do that as well. So expect to be transformed. Also, be who you are. Be who you are. The older I get, the older my children get, the more I realize I'm a mom and I'm not like that 23-year-old right out of college, crazy youth director, youth minister anymore. Um, and so I need to be that. I need to be who it is that I am. Um, and for some of us as adults, participation might be a little bit awkward. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to feel weird playing one of those crazy games with young people. But have fun with that. Be okay with being a little bit awkward. Turn it into a positive example of how we can learn and grow even when we're uncomfortable. That's a great example for us to share with young people. Um, and don't try to participate in ways uh, that the youth do if it isn't you. So don't, don't try to be someone you're not, but figure out ways to participate who you are. That doesn't exclude you. That doesn't mean I feel uncomfortable, I shouldn't do this. That means I feel uncomfortable, how do I participate in this and set a good example and still be me? So be genuine. Participation is genuine. And participation is complicated. It's complicated. Um, it's not just a vacation, you know? It's not just a vacation. Hanging out with youth and having a great time at events with them is not just fun. It always used to make me laugh when I would take my, my group to confirmation camp and, um, and parents would think I was taking a vacation for a week. You know, <laughs> what's that all about? This is not a vacation. When we're, if you think back to participation, if we are experiencing and expecting to be transformed um, and observing what's going on with our young people and drawing that out, and uh, that's a lot of work. That's, that's a lot of mental work and a lot of energy is expended. So it's, it's complicated. Think about that. Um, there's a lot that we're doing all at the same time. It takes energy, it takes enthusiasm, it takes concentration, it takes authenticity, it takes us being genuine and being real. Full participation is hard work. This is not a vacation. Uh, listening, uh, another, uh, we're gonna move on from uh, uh, participation to listening. Another skill in hand-holding is listening, and hand-holding again is ministry of presence. Listening is active. 
we need to listen with our ears. So of course, we need to make sure that we're hearing what's being said, that we're in conversations with our young, our young people, that we're actually hearing what they're saying and, um, and paying attention to them. Um, location can be key to ensure that you hear the speaker. When we're participating, get, uh, get in with the group. And, and, uh, and again, participation, participation, participation. Just be in there with young people so that we can actually hear what's going on. So listen with your ears. But um, listening, is also, listening also happens with our eyes. When we're listening to young people and when we are present with them, um, we should face them if appropriate uh, or comfortable. Um, and I'll just make a note, face-to-face -face, uh, listening is ideal. But I, um, I've been a part of some conversations in our synod about um, male spirituality. And uh, one of my colleagues shares with me that a lot of times guys talk better with each other if they're side by side, working side by side. So be aware of that. Um, and just to know that if face to face is not comfortable, but side by side works, that's okay. But keep in mind um, to allow for the, the appropriate physical space and to be able to make some eye contact with each other. So whether you're face to face or side by side, have that opportunity to make that eye contact. Um, and, and that you're not wandering around the room distracted either. So listen with your eyes. Listen with your body. Lean into the conversation. Keep your body movements to a minimum. And consider what your body position communicates. Um, so for example, if you're cross-armed, are you, are you defensive? Are you um, not really paying attention? Are you uncomfortable? Just simple things like that to be aware of. Um, what is it that your body and your posture communicate? And also, what is it, as you're looking with your eyes, as you're, as you're listening with your eyes, what is their body language telling you at the same time? And as you're listening to a young person, respond with clarifying questions. So don't just read between the lines or assume that you know what they're talking about. Clarify by asking uh, further questions. So I heard you say this. Um, is this what you meant? Did you mean this? This is what I understood you to mean. Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. Ex excellent, yes. Um, use questions to draw out more information from the person. Um, so are you from San Antonio? How long have you lived there? What is your favorite part of the city? That's where I'm from, so you can change that. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that the focusing is on your listening and not always on your response. I think this is really important for us to remember that listening isn't listening, paying attention, figuring it out, and then boom, we respond, and this is what you do with life. But part of spiritual direction is helping the young person come to some understandings and helping them talk through. So, so focus on the listening and not always what is it that you're going to say next. And don't be afraid of silence. Silence during conversation is okay. It's okay to not necessarily have to say something right away. So uh, pay attention to that. So listening is active. Listening is genuine. Listen because you care. Listen because you care. Um, this is going to be noticed by the listener if you care or not. Uh, and sometimes we have to set good boundaries. Um, maybe a young person is coming up to us and they have this momentous ex uh, experience at the gathering that they want to share with us. Um, and you're afraid that their whole group is going to step out in front of a car, right? <laughs> be sure to stop the group from stepping out in front of the car. Don't just stop and listen, right? <laughs> But, um, but when we set boundaries, I, it sounds like you have something that I, that I would like to hear. I'd, I'd really like to hear more about this. This is not a good time, but can we talk about this later? Um, so, so set good boundaries, and, but, also, but listen because you care. Be open to what questions the youth are asking. Be open to what questions the youth are asking. Try to respond to shocking, accusatory, or otherwise difficult questions with a calm, considerate manner. I always kind of think it's fun to wonder some of, you know, there's always that one kid that you wonder what it is that they're going to say. <laughs> what is it that they're going to ask or what is it that they're going to come up with? And, um, and so uh, genuinely listen and, um, and, and try not to act too shocked. Um, um, and just be open to that and what do, what do those questions really mean? Why is it that they're asking them? Are they uncomfortable? Do they just not want to be there? Is it a really a true question? Be open to those. Um, know what your own buttons are and be aware to not take questions or comments personally. 
So know what your own buttons are. What is, it, what is something that a young person might ask you that could really set you off and, and um, try to make sure that, that it's not about, that your response isn't about you, but that you're really listening to what it is that they're, that they're asking. Um, Non-anxious presence. We are a non-anxious presence with our young people. Um, think on or ask about the reason behind the question or statements being made. What we hear is not always the whole story. And then finally, listening is a discipline. Part of listening well is hearing what is being said. Um, part of listening well is hearing what is not said. Sometimes we learn a lot about what's going on when we notice what the speaker is not saying out loud, um, whether by omission, body language, or emotional response. Um, I have a spiritual director, and I'm always amazed at what she pulls out. You know, she'll say, I'll go through this, my life story in the past six months, and she says, I didn't hear you talk about X, Y, Z. It's like, yeah, I didn't. Wow, what's that all about? So, uh, so what they don't say is just as important as what they do say, and what does that mean? Um, listening is stopping, stopping and focusing on the speaker. Our first tendency is to jump to the response again or the advice, uh, but many times we just need to be there to listen and ask questions and, and be part of that experience for them. And finally, listening is also hard work. Participation is hard work, and so is listening. To listen well, you have to hear, you have to interpret, you have to question, you involve your whole body. It's not easy. It can be very draining um, to listen uh, actively and listen well. So listening is a discipline. So this is hand-holding. This is ministry of presence, participation with our youth, um, uh, listening with our youth. So we're going to move on to finger-pointing now which is the Ministry of Direction. <clears throat> Part of finger pointing is to ask good questions. Ask good questions. Ask open-ended questions as you process events. Uh, these require more than a yes or no answer. Uh, they tend to start with how, where, what, and when. Um, be careful of why questions. Why is not necessarily a bad question, but sometimes that can put people on the defensive. Sometimes why makes them feel like they have to defend themselves. So think about how you might word a question rather than starting with the word why. But ask good questions as you're finger pointing. Make observations. Let me go back, actually. Um, as, you, as you listen, as you ask good questions, listen for answers that lead to more questions, too. So kind of process what the, the way that they answer. Um, and help and use that to help you point even further. Make observations. Remember that you have been an active participant, so be sure to point out the things you notice yourself as well as with others. So it's okay to make those observations. What did you see? What did you hear, think, feel? What did you notice about others? Those are great things to point out. Those are great observations. Um, combine observations with questions to help participants discover how they're being transformed. So maybe don't say, oh, I noticed this, but did anyone else notice this? Or what did you notice about this? And so draw some of that out from them as well, and then participate in that conversation. Um, for, and another example that we give to you, I, I noticed when we're painting the elderly woman's house that you always had a smile on your face. What were you feeling while we were working today? Those are the kind of observations that we want to make as we finger point. And then finally, but most importantly, point to Jesus. Because again, remember, this isn't just about feeling good and being happy, but this is about God active in our lives and our world transforming us. So where is Jesus in all of this? As we're observing, as we're pointing, point to Jesus. Um, the point is to connect, these, uh, connect all of our experiences to our life of faith. So connect them to our own lives, connect them to the life of faith of others. How did you see Christ today while you were painting? Everyone was working together, taking time for each other, helping each other. Where do you see Christ in this same way at, at home? Where do you see Christ the same way at school? Um, so draw those in, not just to the event that you are participating in, but where can we see this in our own lives at home? So um, what we're going to do at this time now is... Uh, practice some of these skills, actively participating and listening and questioning with each other. Um, we're going to use a tool today from the peer ministry leadership training. Uh, peer ministry leadership is a highly effective training curriculum that equips youth and adults with communication and leadership skills for relational ministry in their church, in their homes, in their school, and their community. <coughs> 
You can learn more about peer ministry leadership at the website on the card that you should have in your folders. In your folders, you should have a sheet that has um, wheat. It's called the wheat. It's, exp it's Appendix 1, and I've been told it was in your folders. So look for wheat. Pull that out. The, the, the website is there, www.peerministry.org. It's a fantastic resource to use to help young people connect their faith life with their daily life um, and sharing that story with others. So today we're going to use this wheat card to help us, and um, this, these are for you to copy and cut and give to your participants at the trainings. Um, we're going to use these wheat cards as a, a, to practice and as a tool to start conversations. Um, these can also be used as a prompt when you get stuck in conversations to know what to ask. W stands for where. Where are you from? Where do you live? H, hobbies. What are your interests? What do you do in your spare time? E is event. Why are you at this event? Who brought you to this event or what brought you to this event today? Acquaintances. Who is it that you know? And travel. Where have you been? What places have you seen? These questions can be helpful. They're um, kind of the kinds of questions that most of us have some experience with. They're open-ended questions that can provide to more information and more questions getting to know a person. So what we'll do now in just a second when I give you, after I'm finished giving instructions, is we're going to practice our listening and participation and observation skills. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to break into groups of three. And each person will have a chance to be each different role in your group. The first person, the first role is to be the speaker. So you will be the one sharing information. Um, the second role is the person who is uh, asking questions and listening. Asking questions and listening. So we have a speaker, we have a, a person who's asking and listening, and then you'll have the third person will be an observer. And their job is to watch both the, le the listener and the speaker and see what, uh, and, and just observe what's going on. Just make some notes, mental notes, or if you need to jot them down, just make some notes to yourself. What's going on with their, um, with their body language? What's going on? What kinds of questions were helpful? Which ones were not? So make those observations. So you're going to have five minutes in each role. So you'll start with three people in each of the roles, and then at the end of five minutes, I'll give you a five-minute warning, and you'll switch roles. And then again, uh, a five-minute warning, you'll switch again. So everybody has an opportunity to be the listener and the speaker. And then at the end of that time, um, you will share the observations. We'll give you five more minutes to share the observations that you made as you were watching the conversations happen. Does that make sense? Is everybody kind of clear on those directions? We're going to move on to our next activity. Um, and what you're going to do for this activity is you've been given at the, the last page, Appendix 2 of your curriculum, um, there is uh, some scenarios for you to practice with. Um, you'll stay in the groups that you're already in. And you can run through a couple of them. You don't have to run through necessarily all four. Just run through a couple uh, of your choice, determining ways to process what's happened in those scenarios. So talk in your groups. What kinds of things would you point out? What kind of questions would you ask? Um, what, might you, what conversation might you have with your young people? When would it be appropriate to have those conversations? How would you make that happen so that you can be uh, pointing out and observing what's going on in, during the events. Um, so go ahead and spend, I'm going to give you um, maybe 10 minutes to, to pick out a couple and talk about how you might process those and then we'll come back together. Okay. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next section. Uh, before we do, there's a couple of resources. The Peer Ministry Leadership Training, an excellent resource to, uh, uh, for, for those who might want to go forward and, uh, and get a little bit more in depth with listening. Uh, participation, Ministry of Presence, uh, Ministry of Direction. Um, there's a great book by Karen Lee Thorpe, How to Ask Great Questions. So a great resource for learning how to ask great questions. And then uh, finally, something that we've used, I know at, at camp in our synod and probably uh, many camps across uh, the, U the U.S. have used called DRAG. And there's an Appendix 3 there for you at the back, um, a handout for you. Um, how do you drag something? You, so you do the event, you, you do something, you reflect on it, you analyze it, you generalize it, and then you godify it. How does this apply to our faith journey? So um, some, he some helpful resources as we move on from our section on, um, on processing these events and experiences, okay? Next, we're going to be talking about how do we connect events and experiences to daily life? How do we connect events and experiences to daily life? Because again, we don't want it to just be the event 
and then it's over and we move on, but how does it change us? How does it uh, apply to what we do from now on in our daily lives? <coughs> Significant research and study has been done that over the last 15 to 20 years in attempts to figure out what transforming youth ministry actually looks like. Um, and so for this portion of our training today, we can look to uh, two findings that the exemplary youth ministry study has produced in conjunction with other studies and research. Um, so first, the entire congregation makes a difference in youth ministry, the entire congregation. This isn't just about a really great pastor or a really great youth director or a really great set of sponsors, but everybody is important in this. Um, the events that, take, that youth take part in will be most effective if we don't just involve the youth and the adults who participate with them, but everybody in the congregation on some level. Um, even if that is just awareness, that they know what's going on. How frustrating is it when our congregation members have, uh, have, have no idea that for the last 10 years we've had a confirmation banquet at the end of the year, right? We want people to know what's going on, um, and that's important, and they can take ownership in youth ministry if they know what's going on. Of parents who report that their faith is extremely important in their daily lives, 67% of their teens report that faith is extremely or very important in their daily lives, and only 8% of those parents' teens report that faith is not very or not important in their lives. So when faith is important in the daily life of an adult, it is typically uh, and statistically important in the life of their teenager. This is what we find. All this to say that parents make a difference in the faith lives of their teenagers. Um, so this means also that the events our youth take part in will be most effective if we also involve the parents of the youth and give parents opportunities to grow in faith as we, ha uh, as we strive to have maximum impact on um, transforming effect of these events. So how do we do this? Um, youth ministry events range in scope and activity level from weekly Bible studies to week-long mission trips and connecting these ev events and experiences to daily life is more than just telling the congregation and the parents about your travels afar. So it's more than just informing them. Um, so we're gonna go over some ideas now for connecting these events and experiences and then you're gonna have a quick opportunity in groups to discuss some ideas that you have too. All right, so connecting events to daily life. Set goals for how your events can be transforming. This kind of goes back to what we've done in some of our prior trainings too. Always important to have goals. Set goals for how your events can be transforming. How do these goals match up with the overall goals for your ministry with youth as well? How does this connect everything that you're doing? What kind of goals would you have for a weekly Bible study? <laughs> Maybe how can the youth apply what they've learned to the rest of their week? Um, how can you communicate to youth what this would look like in their daily life? Um, and what you, what you set as your goals must be communicated in some way. What kind of goals would you have for a summer trip? These will probably look very different. Uh, ultimately, our, our general goal is going to be the same, um, but some of our basic goals are going to be a little bit different. What are your goals for the trip? Um, and how, what are your goals for how this experience will then come back and translate? Um, sometimes our weekly Bible studies are a little bit easier because it's part of our daily routine. Um, the trips become these mountaintop experiences and we have to be a little bit more intentional. So how, what are our goals for tying those into our, our everyday life? And how can you encourage youth to continue living that experience when they get home? What can they do when they're not on the youth trip anymore to carry over what they've learned? So it's helping them see how to put that in practice. Also, how do you communicate with parents about what was experienced? How do you communicate with parents? And I would say you can never communicate in enough ways. You can never communicate. And we have so many different ways to communicate. Um, these days it seems like everybody communicates. I have friends who I can contact best by email and friends I contact best by phone and friends that respond only to texts and some people that I have to make sure I catch them on Sunday morning. So, um, so people communicate in different ways and part of our responsibility is to learn how people best communicate and also give a lot of options. So for instance, you might set up a youth ministry website and upload pictures regularly. Um, you might provide examples or outlines of a weekly Bible study to parents that you send home. Um, you might have regular parent meetings or lunches. Uh, gather them together and have conversation. Newsletters, bulletin inserts, um, there's a lot of other ways to do that. Calling on the phone. I always used events uh, in my, of course, I had a smaller congregation, but I always use events uh, as a, a, an opportunity to call and invite the youth 
um, but a lot of pastoral care happens on those phone calls. Um, so for me, sending out a, a sign-up sheet was not as effective as calling because I, I got to be in conversation with people as well. Um, you can email or blog while on a trip or journal. These are ways that we can bring the event home. And then you can also send letters or postcards while on a trip. So there's some things that you can do while you're gone even to communicate back home with, with parents. It's also important to involve the parents in your event somehow. So for events locally or at home, you can invite parents to participate. Um, they can cook meals, lead a game, bring snacks, um, and emphasis on the bring and not just send along. So don't send it with the don't send it with your youth and, and uh, you know they drive through the drive through and they get out with the dessert and parents leave. But have them come in and bring it and and experience the event a little bit. Um, have an interactive blog where parents can ask questions and make comments while you're on a trip. <clears throat> and also on trips, involve parents in the fundraising opportunities and the planning, uh, the planning of the events, the, uh, the sending services or covenanting services, and then again when you come back. And then finally, create activities for families to do together that support or extend the goal of your event. So as you're informing, uh, maybe you're going on a trip and you're involving people in the planning and you uh, give them the goals for what you hope will happen and some ways that they can help tie that in after the event has occurred. Um, send, I send service ideas home that relate to your topic. If you did a mission trip, send ideas home with the, the young people when they get back on what they might do with their families, how they might serve with their families. Um, provide daily devotional materials that reflect the lessons learned at Bible study. So maybe you have a weekly Bible study and each time the kids come, they get handed out a sheet that gives them some opportunities to talk about this and things to do at home that connect with that lesson for the next week. How will you share your events with the congregation? How will you share your events with the congregation? Through worship. Um, have the youth give a sermon on the lessons they've learned through an event or a series of, of events. Have them in some way communicate or proclaim the message. Um, and their experience. You could pre prepare a slideshow to highlight the experiences. Um, I know we often have a slideshow running of day camp or, or VBS or something so that people can see the pictures and kind of feel a little bit of a part of that. Um, but also, and I think a lot of times we do that on the larger events, VBS, trips, camps, but remember to take pictures on a daily basis too. If you have a weekly Bible study with young people, take pictures. Let people know what's going on every Wednesday night too. Um, so it's not just about those big things, but it's about all the, all the, the local and daily things that we do. A written communication. Prepare short paragraphs or inserts for your Sunday bulletin. Write articles for the newsletter. Have something on the screen. So written communication for congregational members. Write articles for a newsletter if your church has a newsletter so people know what's going on. Maybe have your youth write articles. If they've had a transforming experience, ask them to write about that too. Um, and share, uh, have them share their own thoughts and their own words with the congregation. Provide visual images around the church. Pictures, written work from the young people, bulletin boards, all sorts of ways that people can stop in the morning and connect, or stop in the evening and connect with what's going on. Involve congregational members in events. Just as we can involve parents in events, involve congregational members. Have, them, uh, have other members besides just parents provide meals or snacks. Um, invite members to share gifts with the youth. Uh, one year we had a con uh, an older couple in our congregation that loved, they went ballroom dancing every week. So we had a youth group experience where they came and they taught the kids how to ballroom dance. It was wonderful. Um, and what happened, I mean, none of the kids really did a lot of dancing. They were a little bit, they, they felt a little bit uncomfortable. What happened was the couple enjoyed getting to know them so much they invited them to their house for a Christmas party a few months later. And the kids were thrilled, and everybody came to youth group that night, and we walked uh, down the street to their house, and the story sharing, and, um, and the name, you know, they knew the names now, and they could talk to the kids, and on Sunday mornings, you could see them interacting, and it was, it was marvelous. So invite them to use their skills, sewing, car maintenance, biblical storytelling, life stories, and faith stories that they might be interested in sharing. Involve as many people as you can. And finally, congregational mentors and prayer partners. Um, you can use these throughout the year. You can use them for special events on trips, but use them for out, throughout the year, too. Uh, maybe you can create some little cards like a little world vision, you know, have the picture of the young person and their name and some information about them and have congregational members adopt a, adopt a youth or something like that so that they can be praying for them throughout the year. That's another great way to in, involve them in youth ministry and help them get to know the young people. Um, and that kind of brings me to a, a, a story about a man in our congregation um, 
he has a pocket full of lifesavers. And from the time that kids are old enough to put a, a hard candy in their mouth, he will give each child a candy every Sunday morning. And he knows every one of their names, and he always makes sure to recognize them. So a few years back, I was doing a survey and asking me, we, our Sunday school teacher for the high school was, was quitting, and we had to find another volunteer. And I asked the students who it was that they'd like to see. So we took the survey, and they just wrote down a list of, of names. And this man's name occurred more than anybody else's as somebody to teach Sunday school. Now, I'm here to tell you that would have been a horrible experience. <laughs> Bad idea for him to teach Sunday school. But... Why did they pick him? Because he knew their name and they knew him. So that's how we can involve our congregational members in the lives of our young people. How will you intentionally share your event experiences with youth who could not attend? Storytelling with purpose. Storytelling with purpose. So have a dinner and a story or picture sharing night when you return from a trip or at the conclusion of a school year or at the end of a Bible study series. Have some kind of culminating event where you can share stories. Um, and especially if you go somewhere and some youth are not able to attend, have them share stories with the youth. Have the ones who went on the, or participated in the event, uh, have them share stories with the youth who could not attend, particularly stories of transformation. Um, have the youth who experienced great change learn how to tell those stories of faith by sharing with each other, with their peers. Um, and, and share family stories with you who cannot attend. Um, instead, of, uh, instead of everybody, you know, we always come back from bonding experiences and, and people feel closer and there's those inside jokes and inside stories. And we need to be very uh, careful not to let that exclude, but actually use those stories as a way to include people. So we're, because we want to share those stories and we want to, uh, we want to experience that bonding, but we want to also be intentional about bringing other people in. And what an opportunity to have those stories and use them to bring other people in and, and all laugh together. Um, <clears throat> And then there's always those stories. I remember the time when there was always stories when people came to my house to visit and we would want my dad to tell a story. And have those be regular experiences in your youth group, the stories that you tell on a ritual basis over and over again that, that become part of who you are and who your group is. Group building. Include youth who cannot attend in an event in the group building phases of planning too. So just because they can't go on the event, include them in the pre-event uh, maybe planning process. Let them be a part of that. Maybe even covenant with them. We know that you can't be there, but how can we be in communication with you um, and have them covenant to participate in that way? Communicate while you're gone. So just as we communicate with parents in the congregation, communicate with the youth who can't go. And then also involve other youth parents and congregation in that planning. Again, fundraising, covenanting, um, prayer buddies and mentors. All those are different ways that um, young people who are not able to be participants in an event can um, participate. We're going to move into the final section of our training today. Um, this is a section on managing your group during an event. Managing your group <laughs> during an event. Um, <laughs> some of these tips will apply only to trips and some of them will apply to uh, daily or local events. Some will apply to both. Um, and, and I put the picture up on the screen because sometimes that might be how we feel when we're trying to manage a group of teenagers. But I also found a really great quote uh, online by Jane Nelson. When did we ever get the crazy idea that to make children do better, first you have to make them feel worse? Right. So it's not all about correction and rules, but it's about, help, uh, it's about our preparation and what we do to be ready to help the, the experience go smoothly for them, as smoothly as possible, and then how do we react when it doesn't go smoothly? Um, what, are, what are some things we can have in our back pocket to help us manage the, the stress in those kinds of situations? How can we, how can we be prepared to manage um, during events so that we don't make young people feel worse, but we make them feel better about themselves? Um, so, again, some of these will apply to trips only. Some of them will apply to local or daily kinds of pieces. Um, managing your group, cell phones. Um, I remember the first year that youth in my group actually had cell phones um, because, it, you know, they were still fairly new. And we decided to uh, ban the cell phones from the trip and not have youth bring cell phones. And that brought with it a whole host of problems. <laughs> Um, so we had to get creative in the next years. We had to ask, are we going to bring cell phones? Are we going to allow them? And if so, 
how will we use them? Is there a way that we can allow them to come on? Because what, what's happened now is that cell phones are a reality for us, for our young people. And so are there ways that instead of uh, uh, digging in our heels and saying absolutely not, um, what are the ways that we can use them in ministry? Um, so, how, so will we allow them and how can we? Uh, at our junior high gathering this year, uh, as, as part of each worship that we did, our theme was, uh, was OMG, oh my God, and we talked about that being a, a statement of faith. Um, and during worship, we would have these OMG moments, and we would invite the youth to pull out their cell phone and think about what the message they had just heard, how, what was their oh my God moment about that message, and text it to a friend. It was so cool. It was so cool. So there was text going off all around. There was par- we had parents that said, I got this text from my kid during worship. It was amazing. And then we just had them put them back. We set the rules and the parameters, and then they put them back in their pockets, and then they left them alone. And then um, we also had a scavenger hunt uh, that was a picture scavenger hunt on, uh, during the event. And so they all had their cell phones and could take pictures and, and pull those all together. Um, again, we set the boundaries, we set the parameters, and then we uh, gave baggies out to the, to the sponsors and said, if you would prefer to collect your cell phones at the, you know, at, the, at the appropriate times and keep them in this baggie, we will do, you, know, you can do that. So we provided ways for the sponsors to help manage that as well. So will you use them? Can you use them effectively? Or are they going to distract? Those are all questions for your own conference, context. Um, but uh, major question, will you allow them to be used? How are you going to, if you are, how are you going to monitor their use? Um, what boundaries will you set? Uh, for instance, at, at more of a local event, like a week, weekly Bible study, will you allow them to have them? Do you ask them to turn them off? Do you ask them to turn them in at a door? Um, how do you manage that? Um, what works best for your group? If you know that you've got a lot of group members that just absolutely can't handle having it in their hand and not doing something with it, Maybe your group is the one that turns it in at the door. But if you know that they can be responsible, just simply ask them to turn it off and put it in their pockets, and that might be the how you handle it with your group. Um, on trips and so forth, do, are there certain times where you use them? Is it only, uh, only for a one designated hour during the day? Is it only in the car, or is it absolutely not in the car because you're bonding with those you're present with? How, how do you manage that, and how do you set those boundaries? And then the final question you're going to want to think about is what is your church's liability if the kids bring their phones on a trip? Um, Do you you have some issues with that? As you're managing your group, transportation. How big is your group and how will this affect the kind of transportation and the type, uh, the amount of transportation? Do you need buses? Do you need vans? Do you need cars? So how, what kind of transportation is the most practical for you to use in your situation? Those, that's something to think about. Um, and then as you consider, how will you separate your groups into vehicles? How will you separate your groups? This is, may seem like everybody just get in a car, but we don't want to like leave Johnny in the bathroom at the church because everybody assumed he got into a car and he went into the church building. So um, do you do this randomly? Do you allow them to pick the cars? Do you, um, do you set seats? Will you rotate group members uh, from car to car to allow different bonding experiences to happen? Um, If you're in a church van or a bus, do you switch seats? Does everybody keep their own seat? These these are some things to consider. Do you have behavioral concerns to consider who you really might not want in the same vehicles? Um, And what are some physical concerns to consider? What are some physical concerns of, of your young people to consider and how can they be the most comfortable? Will you or can you use transportation time as group building time? Can you use it as group building time? Um, so you might have a, a, that you bring along with you on, on a car trip, um, a, group, a group building game. Yeah, we, this is a, a key thing for me and my family, uh, not even just in the youth group, but we have little things that we bring in the car, little games that we play. So even if we're going across town, um, we, we have little uh, the before and after alphabetizing game or things like that that we can just throw out or the 20 questions game, things that we can do together to, um, to make the time pass. Um, conversation questions. Do you throw out a would you rather and talk about that? Um, Again, do you allow phones or not? Do you allow video games or not? Even books. Uh, My son has become an avid reader. I even had to go to Barnes & Noble and buy him a book light because he wants to read in the car at night. He's seven. And uh, he wants to read in the car at night. And um, but I've kind of been a little sad because he doesn't talk to me in the car as much anymore. So, uh, so what, as we think about our interaction with youth, do we allow the cell phones and the video games, or do we uh, use that as 
as conversation time. How will you get your group back to vehicles when, you, when they're supposed to be there? Be specific about times. Don't say return to the bus in 15 minutes. Try saying something like be back to the bus at 2.05. Or as my husband would always say on trips with our youth, be back at 1.47. And they just look at him like, what are you talking about? But they always got back at 1.47 because they knew 1.47, that's a weird time. They could remember that. Um, how do you get the group on the bus uh, at the meeting point on time? Uh, think about giving yourself a 15 minute cushion. So if you really need to be gone by 2.15, your bus return time is two or maybe even a little earlier depending on the circumstances. So just be, be thoughtful and mindful of those kinds of things. Who will drive and what are your safety concerns? Who will drive and what are your safety concerns? Um, important to think about, um, do you need to have uh, release paperwork? Do you need to have driver license, um, copies of driver's license and things like that? And finally, how much baggage, for particularly for trips, how much baggage? Because if you, if you figure <laughs> this many people in this car and the bags don't fit, what are you going to do? So consider, uh, consider that. Also, don't, don't forget to consider the kinds of supplies that you need to bring as the youth leader too. So everybody gets one bag, but if that's barely gonna fit, where are you gonna put your stuff to? So. Okay, lodging. As you think about where you will stay on a trip, where will you and other adults sleep? Where will you and other adults sleep? It's so important for, uh, it's important for everybody, even the youth, to get sleep, but particularly the adults, because you've got a lot you're gonna be managing. And remember, we talked, this isn't a vacation, this is hard work. So you're gonna need your rest at the end of the day. So where will you and other adults sleep that makes the most sense for you to get rest, but also be aware of what's going on? What are the sleeping arrangements overall? Are you gonna be in a big room? Do you separate the boys and the girls? Are you gonna have different rooms? How, how are those gonna be managed? Um, those kinds of pieces you want to you want to be mindful of and think about your own context and what will um, uh, what will go best in those uh, situations. And if you're in a hotel, who do you room with? Who um, there might be a group of boys that uh, you would really not want to all be in one room together without a sponsor. So. <laughs> Um, or I should say girls, last year at our senior high event, we had a group of girls, our senior high gathering in our synod, we had a group of girls that took all the mattresses off their bed and made a fort in the middle of the room. <laughs> it was really great and really scary all at the same time. And then what are your safe haven, your risk management policies to, um, to think about those, um, the ways that you will train leaders, um, to think about making sure that adults aren't sharing beds with youth, uh, that there's... Um, not an adult and a youth in, one, in a hotel room by themselves, those kinds of pieces. How, how do you manage all of that? So what are, your, what are your policies there? Managing your group in terms of food. How many meals are you going to be eating together uh, on this particular event and how will you handle those to be prepared for that? Where do you plan to eat? So as you're thinking about the kinds of, uh, the kinds of meals you're gonna eat, that can inform how much money, how much time you need, um, can you have snacks with you in a hotel room or at your venue? Are you gonna to have to buy those kinds of things? These are all things that you need to plan for. Um, is there gonna be a continental breakfast and all of your boys are gonna be hungry for the rest of the day? Those kinds of pieces. Uh, or girls, I, I was always a very hungry girl, so I should not be sexist there. And then will you give food money allowances or will you pay as a group? And how does that change things? Um, and, and if you're paying as a group, do you give them a limit? You can, uh, you can buy something on the menu up to this price. Um, how do you, uh, if they're doing food money allowances, have you shared with them to tip their servers, things like that? Um, are they not eating if you give allowances and keeping all of their money to spend another way? And, you, and then you have a dehydrated and hungry child. So all of the things to consider uh, for what's gonna work best in your context. All right, and then group management overall, the whole group together. If you have a very small group, um, you and your sponsors may all manage each other together. But if you have a very large group of young people, you might want to break into smaller groups to have a designated leader that's responsible for the, that set number of young people. So when you come back to the bus, your leader is counting their eight heads and knowing that those eight people, instead of trying to count and recount, because we've all done this, we've gotten on the bus and we've counted, and then we thought, I'm gonna just make sure, and we count again, and then our number's just different, right? So to, to have people making sure that everyone they're responsible for in their smaller group is there can be really helpful. Um, and then in terms of processing and just checking in with each other and seeing what's going on. 
um, another, uh, another way that small groups can be helpful. Because if you have 35 kids at the end of the day all sharing highs and lows, that can be hard, but if you break them into smaller groups of eight, that can be much more manageable. Covenant issues. Um, how are you gonna manage behaviors at events? And this goes not just for trips and things, but throughout the year. If you have a regular Bible study, um, how do you set, how do you set the, the parameters? How do you set the, um, the tone or the environment that our young people are going to be growing in? Um, that's really important. So how many, how many adult leaders do you take to an event? And it, again, it depends on what your needs are. If you're doing some smaller group Bible study and, and, and they're, you, know, you're bring, you need to bring each leader that, that goes with a group of five or six along, great. If you're looking more at, um, at simple management kinds of issues, maybe you bring one per eight or nine, uh, those kinds of pieces. If you've got a group that's a little squirrelier than others and you might need some extra hands to make sure that uh, they're where they need to be um, and you can be with them and keeping an eye on them, you know, you, those are considerations. Come prepared with backup. Always have those games, those questions, uh, those little ti those time uh, uh, things that you can do in the in-between times. So for instance, uh, if you get stuck in a line, a really long line at a fast food restaurant and you, uh, you throw out a question. So as they're all waiting on their food, they've got something they're talking about or a little game that you can play. Or if you're waiting for them to open the doors at the Superdome, um, you can sit on the, sit on the ground and uh, play a quick game of Yahtzee because you brought your dice with you or something like that. To, something to have, so the just in case. Um, a Bible and a few devotionals would be really nice too. So we can sit and have some faith conversation. Um, always have something like a pack of cards, some dice, a few small portable games, question, question cards, faith talk cards are another great resource that you can use to share faith in those kinds of situations. Um, just have a few of those and you, it's just a simple little bag that you could bring that would have all of that there ready for you to just pull out and, and use. And so make a ministry opportunity of this. When you have backup, you can make a ministry opportunity. So if there's challenges like a flat tire, a long line, or a missed appointment, uh, poor directions, use that as an opportunity to bond. It's really easy to get frustrated in those kind of events and let it be negative. Remember, um, we're gonna try to make the most out of each situation that we're presented with. And sometimes that's really hard because we're human too, and we get frustrated and we get tired. Um, but sometimes being prepared for those things can help us manage them a little bit better. Pull out your backup and keep positive. And then finally, keeping track of your groups. Small groups to meet and gather, having a way to see each other above a crowd, like bringing a, a sign or something that you can a stick, something on a stick that you can hold up so if you have a large group and there's going to be a crowd by you can uh, they can find you um, counting heads constantly and other pieces like that so all ways that we can prepare I mean and there's probably a thousand other things that we could think of but these I, I feel like these are some of the basics that we can use when we're learning how to manage a group and and ensure the smoothest time uh, as possible for young people at an event, the most transformational experience that we can give them. And so, this concludes our training. You're ready to go. You're ready to go. I'd again encourage you to check out the other two training sessions online if you have missed them or even just for a quick refresher. And I would also encourage you to participate in the free online webinar sessions um, on Lutheran Theology and Effective Youth Ministry Practices. And you can watch those uh, uh, live or you can download them also. Um, so in just a few minutes, we're going to take a break. Um, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I would say for all of this, for all of group management, what you, co what you covenant with your young people, you stick with as well. And you, and you make sure that you have boundaries and parameters that are appropriate for both groups. And if you're going to pull cell phones, I want to do a thing. So encourage your youth and adults to bring watches. Yes. Because oh, yeah. Good point. Good point. We're going to have a few, uh, few minutes here uh, after a break to ask some questions and to talk through the curriculum just a little bit. Um, but let's go ahead and close in prayer. We'll give you a quick break after Catherine comes up. You're good? Okay, great. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunities we have to lead events and experiences for youth in our care. Help us to always be looking for ways in which we can help them connect what they do with us to their daily lives 
to their family, to the congregation, and to the world in which we live. Guide us as we lead and as we participate with youth. Amen.